Okay. <clears throat> so getting started, I have everyone present in this classroom except for Jackie Walker, right? I mean, obviously, everyone else is not going to say, no, I'm not here. But okay, a couple things before we get started. Make sure that you're, if you're in this physical classroom using a clicker, you're set to channel 33. Or if you are using a smartphone for, phone from either classroom, that you're in session ID web phys, as spelled there. Because I'm going to have a clicker question after just one slide. So I want to make sure everybody's prepared. This is the first time that they're actually counting toward your grade. Um, after we ask the question, if most everyone gets it right, like if it's 75% or better getting it right, I would just go straight to grabbing a random card and calling that person's name and asking for their explanation of how they got to their answer. Question. Question about how cool. things work. Is it important to switch to one or eight or? Uh, no, it's only important to be on channel 33. Okay. Okay, another thing, the first lab reports are graded and returned. While most people had good scores, some did not. You should be able to look at the PDF file that was returned and see where you lost points. And if you have a disagreement, talk to Yafet, our TA, and you know, talk to him about you know, what did you take off for. I think it was here. And you know, try to find an agreement between the two of you. If you can't find agreement between the two of you, then bring it to me. You know, I don't want to undercut my TA, but I do want to make sure that everything's fair so that if you, know, you guys can't work it out, then bring it to me and we'll talk it over. Okay, today we're going to be working on solving one-dimensional kinematics problems. That's basically all we're going to do today is practice working homework problems. Now, we had our first meaningful homework was due on Friday, another one due today. If you have homework questions, Remember that you can always email me, come to my office during office hours. Um, I'm going to try to make a little Google Hangout thing and post it on Moodle so people at Southwestern can, you know, contact me via, via the Google Hangout to um, ask questions and whatnot as well because you know, I want them to be able to also get help if they have homework problems. So be looking for that on Moodle. So I, here's our, our clicker question and you cannot answer yet because I have not moved forward. So now you can answer question, what is the acceleration of a vertically thrown ball at the peak of its arc? This was the question I answered at the end of the last class period. To see if yours was high definition or not. But. Okay, I'll give it about another 10 seconds. All right, everybody have your answers in? Yes. All right, closing it. And the breakdown that we got was 4, 8, 34, 4, and 0. Now, rather than me just answering, whoever's name is on the back of my business card here, provide the answer. <laughs> okay, so this is Nancy Lycia. So, Nancy, who should be at Southwestern, can you give an explanation for which answer you think is correct? You chose B as in boy, or okay, and why do you think that was correct? Okay, now we had a hard time making it out, but it sounded like you said you're going up, you're not going up anymore, it's going to come down, and so that's why you chose zero. Is that an accurate portrayal of what you said? Okay. Now, something for everyone here, you can see that wasn't the most popular answer. When I'm asking you the question, I want your thoughts. If I expected you to know the right answer, I wouldn't have you even in class, right? We're learning. 
So in this case, I appreciate that while she didn't have the most popular answer, she defended it with what she was thinking, right? That's an important thing. So the correct answer was indeed C, but it's important to look at common things. She had the most common incorrect answer. It's important to look at those common misconceptions so that we can confront them. So if we were talking about the velocity, her answer would have been absolutely correct because it had an upward velocity and then it's going to have a downward velocity. And at that instant, the velocity is zero. That is, its motion is not changing at that instant. But velocity and acceleration are two different things. Acceleration is the rate at which the velocity is changing. So if the acceleration was zero and the velocity was zero, then that would mean the speed is zero, velocity is zero, and it's not going to change. So it would have to just stay there if the acceleration was zero. So the correct answer, as actually shown in this picture right here, was that the acceleration actually throughout the entire flight, if we can ignore air resistance, was 9.8. This is 9.81. Our textbook would go with 9.80 meters per second squared down. Now, I did make a caveat here, and it's important that we understand this. In general physics, unless we are told otherwise, we ignore all kinds of things that are real but small. So in this case, air resistance is real. I know you guys probably weren't the nerd I was, but when I was a kid, when like we would drive from Monterey Bay Academy to Virgil Haas Memorial Junior Academy, from MBA to VHM, I would sit there with my hand out the window and go, whew, playing with the wind and feeling it pushed back on my hand. Our general physics approximation is that there was no air resistance. I put my hand out there and I wouldn't feel a thing. We know that's not a correct approximation, right? But for situations where a ball does not drop very far, doesn't get a very large speed, it's approximately correct. At low speeds, the air resistance is proportional to the speed. So a speed of zero, it's zero. And it doesn't get very large very quickly. At high speeds, it actually moves to higher power. So proportional to the speed squared and so on. So unless told otherwise, we're going to assume that the air resistance is zero. Now, this brings up a commonly asked question. What would happen if you dropped a penny off the top of a very tall building? Like, let's say you somehow were pitching pennies off the top of the Sears Tower. And that penny comes down and hits somebody in the head. What would happen to the person who gets hit by the penny? I heard it would hurt. Well, a common thing people say is it would just go right through their head. You know, kill the poor guy. Now, some of you may have enjoyed watching this TV show Mythbusters, and this is one of the things they looked into. That idea of the penny hitting the person and just slicing through them is based on no air resistance. And the facts as we understand them with, you know, with the penny, you throw it out, it's going to start fluttering. And by the time it's dropped, I don't know, something like 50 feet, it's reached what we call terminal velocity. The velocity where the air resistance is equal to the force of gravity pulling down, it just stays at constant speed for the rest of the way. And if it were to hit you, yes, it would hurt. Whoever said that, you're right. It would hurt. But it would not do serious damage. So what the guys at Mythbusters did was they took a uh, staple gun and modified it so they could shoot pennies. <laughs> and they were shooting these pennies at what would be dangerous speeds if you were next to it, but they got back. So they were about the distance of the you know length of the classroom away and they shot the pennies at their little dummy and they found, you know, didn't do much to them. And so they, then Jamie got brave and took off his shirt and they shot him, you know, cause why wouldn't you? They, they also did this with the uh, uh, playing cards, the idea that you could throw a playing card and slice somebody's carotid artery and kill them. And they, they made a little thrower for the cars. They said it was safe. <laughs> hit, hit him in the chest. It stuck in his chest, which was really kind of cool television right there. Um, <laughs> so the bottom line is the reality of life is that the penny dropped from up there isn't going to hurt you. 
if you go to an amusement park and you toss a penny off the top of a ride, it's not going to kill somebody. But it could be a nuisance. Don't do it. Okay? It's always important to get those logic things like don't do bad things. Question, Colton. So in a vacuum, would it move at a, like a potentially more dangerous speed? Yes. In a vacuum, it would be potentially quite dangerous. Yes. It's the air resistance. So in this class, what do we do with air resistance? Put it in the back. <laughs> we pretend it doesn't exist unless we're specifically told to take it into account. Okay, this is the slide I was on before we start talking about that acceleration at the top on Friday. How to solve a problem, right? We're going to be working through solving problems. So looking at how to solve a problem, just methods of approaching it, is really a good thing to do before we start solving them. So... Now we're getting the feedback on the audio again. The first thing to do here, which on our tests will give us 50% of our points, is to draw an appropriate figure to illustrate what's going on in the problem and to talk about the ideas. Now, at this point, our physics ideas is just basically one idea, <coughs> the, the kinematic equations. So at this point, it doesn't take really much of anything for our idea. By the time we get to the first test, we'll have more than one idea, and you'll have to be more specific. But right now, every problem will be, well, using the kinematic equations, right? That's, that's my thought process. That's three points on the test. Okay, next one. Make a list of what is given, that is the things you know, and what can be inferred from the problem. For instance, if I take my tennis ball and I drop it, I didn't tell you the acceleration of the ball, but you know because I dropped it that it's falling in free fall under the acceleration of gravity so you know its acceleration is 9.80 meters per second squared and pointing down. So the problem doesn't say that. You know that. So that's another thing you have to count for, the things that you know. And then list the things that you don't know that you're looking for. Don't list everything you don't know. There's lots of things you won't know. You know, I don't know how old the person was dropping the ball. But I also don't care. Right? So you only want to write the things you're looking for that you don't know. So identify exactly what you need to solve for. And this is where I, as a teacher who's been doing this for over 20 years now, I forget to look for what I'm trying to find. I'll start reading the problem and say, oh, I recognize this type of problem. We're going to do this. I'll start working out the problem. I'll get to the end and have a beautiful answer. And then the student says, yeah, that was right there in the next sentence. That's not what we're trying to solve for. And then I'd be, Arr. right. You want to make sure you're solving for what's being asked for. Then find the equations that will, you'll be using to solve the problem. Solve the problem. And after you solve the problem, check your answer to make sure it makes sense. Make sure it has the right units. You know, if you're asked for the time for the ball to hit the ground and you end up with units of meters per second, you probably made a mistake. Right? So that's another thing. Check. Make sure the units make sense and the time makes sense. If it takes a negative time for the fall to drop and hit the ground, it's a good sign you made a mistake. So our first problem, a dragster here. Now you had a homework problem. Uh, yes. When, Gila. Um, Gila. Gila. Yeah. When finding equations to help solve a problem, do we need to state what the variable No, no. That's just in lab. Her, her question was, when you're finding an equation that you're going to use to solve a problem, do you need to I, to list what the meaning of each variable is in the equation? The answer was no. In the lab, you do, but not for homework problems or for test problems. Okay, so this problem here, similar to a homework problem. Um, okay, I did the homework that's due today as well as the homework that's due Friday with Rachel on Friday, so I'm not sure which one this was from. But we had one that was very similar to this. A dragster starts from rest and accelerates at a constant rate of 1G. How fast is it going when it gets to 400 meters down the track? So following our rules, the first thing I'm going to do is draw a figure, which I've actually already done on the second, next slide. Second thing I'm going to do is identify my variables. Because why, What did I skip there? Yeah, I skipped the principles. Why? Because I only have one principle for today. And so I'm just taking that as a given for all of my problems today. The principle is using the kinematic equations. So the variables. What variables do I know for this problem? Acceleration. Okay, acceleration. What's the acceleration? 1G. 
in numbers, what does 1G translate to? 9.80 meters per second squared. Okay, that's one variable. What else do I know? Okay, the starting and ending positions, X initial. It doesn't tell me X initial. So what do I put for X initial? Yeah, I just decide. I'm not going to go from 750 to 1150. That just wouldn't make sense to my brain. I'm going to go from 0 to 400. And of course, the units there are meters. Notice all of the things, all the variables here have meters or have units, not meters. Okay, anything else I know here? Initial velocity. That's the final thing I know. What's the initial velocity? Was that given or was that assumed? It was given. It said from rest, that told us that the initial velocity was zero. Without that, I would have had to assume, well, I know that when they're racing, they don't allow them to have a rolling start. But probably you guys didn't all, when your kids watch any possible sport there was on TV, so you watch the Winter Nationals and, you know, probably not, right? Okay, so I have all my variables. What am I looking for? I'm looking for time. What should I make my time initial? Zero. Was that given or was that assumed? That was assumed. Gila. Would um, the 9.8 meters per second squared be negative, positive, or negative? Um, okay. When we use the symbol G, not a vector G, but just a G, it always means positive. In our problem, because all the motions in one direction, all my numbers are going to be positive. But that's that's a good question, one to think about. All right, so now that I've got all my variables listed here, acceleration, initial and final positions, initial speed, and I'm looking for the final time, I need to identify which equation to use. What's the fundamental principle I said to use in kinematic equations to find the equation? Okay, now you chose the correct one, Colton. What was your method for choosing the third equation? Uh, just recall. I remember you saying that one. <laughs> okay, the one thing you could have said is, well, you did say more than 80% of my problems are going to use that equation, so that's a good one to guess, right? I mean, if you're, if you're boldly guessing, that's a good one to guess. Jordan? Uh, because it includes acceleration time and velocity and uh, position. Yes. The reason that's the one is because it uses – all of the variables, and we had all of the variables either given or what we're looking for. So that was the logical one to choose. Now, there are times when you'll have a problem that's over-specified. That is, they give you more variables than you need. And in fact, on test questions, probably half of them are over-specified. They'll have one variable you don't need. And the reason for that is to make sure students aren't merely trying to find equations with variables and shove numbers into them <coughs> to make sure that they do have that concept idea of what's going on and how they choose them. But for our kinematic equations, yeah, that, <laughs> that works. So here's my pretty picture. I must have spent a good minute drawing this little dragster and putting the little swishes on the one that's moving so we can see it's got motion. I, once again, have written out our variables. And since we have correctly identified it, I will put the 9.80 meters per second squared there for acceleration. And now I just need to solve the problem. So my equation was x final equals x initial plus v initial t plus 1 half a t squared. I'm looking for time. If I'm looking for time, you notice this equation has time and time squared both in it. It's quadratic. You will need to use the quadratic equation from time to time. And so people should know or be able to use, you know, if you put it in the right form, you have the x is equal to negative b plus minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. But we don't have to do that today, and I'm not going to do the quadratic equation simply because I could, because... While I never put in numbers that aren't zero until the end of a problem, I always put in my zeros at the beginning 
just to make life easy. And so in this case, my X initial was zero. My V initial was zero. So I put an arrow to zero telling me that whole term is going to be zero because one of the numbers there is zero. So my equation becomes a much more manageable X final equals one half a T squared. Now a thing that often students are not really comfortable with starting out the quote master problem solving technique is to solve the problem with the variables, not putting numbers in. A lot of people feel more comfortable with numbers. They feel the numbers are concrete things that they can deal with and they put the numbers in and they feel good solving it that way. And there's nothing wrong with that, but we will see problems where you're not given the mass and you have equations that depend on the mass, but if you put the symbols in, you find, oh, the mass actually canceled out. I didn't need to have the mass, even though individual equations required the mass. So the master problem solver solves the problem symbolically. And one of the beauties of pro solving the problem symbolically is when you get to the end, you can say, well, how did this variable affect my answer? You know, if this variable went up, my answer would have gone up, down, whatever. So I am going to model solving it the, quote, master problem solver way. Nobody's going to mark you off if you solve them a different way. So I'm trying to solve this for time. Obvious algebra here. You want to divide by everything that is not the time that's multiplied by time. So <coughs> that gives me, remember, dividing by a fraction, dividing by one half is the same as multiplying by two. So I'm going to have two X final over a is equal to times squared. Well, final step will square root both sides. And I end up with my time. I should have put an F there. Time final is equal to the square root of two X final over a. And now I go ahead and put in the numbers. So if you put that in your calculator, 800 divided by 9.8, which is you know just a little bit more than 80, square root that, it's going to be somewhere very close to nine seconds. I don't know if we can go to bed tonight having that digit off by one. Thank you. Okay, so there we have our answer. How many significant digits do I have in that answer? We have three if that 400 has three significant digits. That 400 was ambiguous. It could have been 400 plus or minus 50 for all we know the way it was specified. But the fact is the race really is 400 meters. It really was three digits, and so we have three significant digits in our answer. Okay, so that is our first problem solution. Does anyone have questions about the method we went through there? Yes, uh, Aaron, just, right? Yeah. yeah. I was just wondering how much work you would like us to show there with the square root. Would you like us to show all of that? Or can we? Okay, her question is how much work to show. So this is for test questions because homework, you're not showing your work. So for the test question, I would not care to see going from here through this step. These steps here, I really don't care about because if you can do your math, you can do your math. So if you don't want to show those, that's fine. Of course, if you got a different equation here, then it would have been beneficial to show the intermediate steps so I can see what you did wrong. So it's only going to matter if you did it wrong, provided you show enough bones for me to see, yeah, that's what they did. Okay, another question that this did not ask, but that's an interesting question. How fast would this dragster be going at the end of 400 meters? Of course, you don't know the answer offhand, right? I, mean, I hope not. So how can we find how fast it would be going at the end? A question that wasn't asked. By the time. Okay. 
Now, he's giving that answer, and I'm just going to write it down without thinking about it. In other words, it could be right, it could be wrong. I haven't thought about it yet. So he said 400 meters divided by the time, which was 9.04 seconds. Now, that gives you units of speed. So that's a good thing. By the way, 9.04 seconds. Is that reasonable? Yeah, I think so. Is it the right units? Yes. This here is the right units, but it's not the actual answer. Why is it not the answer? Tell me, it was you, Jonathan, who came up with that, right? Yeah, I just, you can divide it out, obviously. So you use the definition V average equals delta X over delta T, right? Yeah. But that's the average speed, not the final speed. Oh, final speed. So to find the final speed, I can take this number and I can use it because we know that V average, if we have constant acceleration, is V initial plus V final divided by two. And V initial in this case was zero. zero. So that means that this method is going to turn out to be pretty simple. I will just take my V average is 400 over 9.04 <coughs> is equal to V final over two, multiply it by two. Not, that's a division rather than a multiplication. Hopefully you all are a little more adept than I am at this. Multiply by two. So 400 times two is 800. I'm doing that in my head. And that will be our final speed. So what is that final speed? Units of meters per second. If you just put 88.5, Oh, you're going to lose a point there because you need to have units, right? 88.5, if you say, Mom, I was driving 88.5 on the freeway and I got pulled over, Mom's going to assume that was miles per hour. If you're doing 88.5 meters per second on the freeway, you are a danger to life. <laughs> okay. That's straight cooking. That's Go ahead. When you ask like, how fast is that going to be? In speed, not velocity? Or? Well, remember, velocity is speed with direction. Right. Okay. How well, fast is technically right. asking what the speed is, so not direction. Okay. In this problem with it being one-dimensional, the fact that it's positive, we can consider it a vector because it's in the positive direction. But that's a unique to being one-dimensional. Okay. Now, there are other ways you could have solved this. You could have gone back and you could have also said V final is equal to V initial plus AT, acceleration multiplied by time. We knew the acceleration was 9.80 meters per second squared and the time 9.04 seconds. Or we could have used V final squared minus V initial squared over two acceleration is equal to X final minus X initial. I could have done that from the initial numbers that were given without having to calculate the time. You have a question, Hannah? Um, on the previous, like 800 divided by 9.04, mm -hmm. Um, I'm just confused why you only multiplied the meters by two. Well, I, I multiplied the entire thing by two. Now, okay, so if I have 400 meters over 9.04 seconds, and I multiply that by two, multiplying by two is the same as multiplying by two over one. Okay. And so I multiply the two on the top and the one on the bottom. We're all good? Okay, let's go to our next clicker question. So this question is about graphs. If you looked at the title of today's uh, lecture in the syllabus, it says it's about graphing. We're going to be doing graphing pretty much exclusively in lab tomorrow, and we've already talked about it a little bit. But the question is, when is the object accelerating? That is, when is acceleration not equal to zero? and your options are, it's always accelerating, the acceleration is never zero in this graph, or it's always, except for the 20 to 40, only from zero to 20, only from 20 to 40, only from 40 to 50, or it's never accelerating.
Yeah, I'll give it about another 10 seconds. I like to give people a warning so that they're, you know, sitting there waiting, thinking they have time to go ahead and punch one in and not say, ah, he stopped too early. I couldn't get in. Okay, stopping it now. Hey, we got more answers this time than we did last time. So our breakdown was not as clear as the last one. But we still had a, a pretty strong majority. Now, in this case, I would like for you to turn to the other people sitting near you and discuss your answer with them, why you came up with your answer, and, and see if you can understand and come to a, a better understanding amongst yourselves. Okay, it looks like most groups have discussed this pretty well. So I'm going to re-poll the question. So in just a second, I'll tell you when I'll have you answer again. Okay, so answer again now after you've discussed it using what you learned from your classmates. <coughs> yes, you're supposed to answer again. Okay, I'll give another 10 seconds before I close it. Okay, closing the question. And this time we had a much more distinct curve. Okay, so choosing a random person, and by the way, Nancy can rest easy. Hers won't come up again for a long time, and neither will Timothy Warren, who's in the Southwest class as well. Did you guys hear that? No. <laughs> we we couldn't hear that very well. I'm gonna turn the volume up again and have you answer or turn the volume up and have you answer again, Timothy, so we can hear you better. All right. All right, so just to answer me because um, from twenty to forty seconds the slope of the graph or the slope of the line is constant, indicating that the acceleration is not being taken. So the answer is D always be set for twenty to forty seconds. That is the correct answer. I wrote these equations over here to help guide people in their thinking. The slope is the speed, one dimensionally speed velocity, and the acceleration is the rate at which the speed is changing. So like Timothy said, if the slope is constant, then it's not accelerating. And so the correct answer was indeed here because that's where the slope, the speed was constant, not changing. Here are the actual graphs from the textbook showing the position, the velocity, of course, I cut off time here, and the acceleration for that motion. So you had a positive acceleration for the first 20 seconds, 
and then constant speed, no acceleration up to 40. And then you had a very strong negative acceleration. What does the negative acceleration mean is happening? It's slowing down. The acceleration is the opposite direction of its velocity for the end. On to problem number two. Problem number two, this is one from the textbook. We have a fella who throws the ball up, it goes up, and much like the song says, what goes up must come down. Or you guys, I'm sure don't know that good music. Uh, <laughs> although Jonathan's trying, man, he's got the beat going on. Um, so the guy throws the ball up, it comes back down. What makes it come back down? Gravity, okay? We will learn about the force of gravity later on when we study dynamics. Dynamics is what causes the motion. Right now we're in kinematics and we just know it's the acceleration of gravity, which is caused by the force of gravity. So it comes back down and this problem specifies that it starts with an initial speed of 13 meters per second and the height from which it leaves the gentleman's hand is considered zero. So it very specifically said height of zero when it leaves his hand. And so I asked a number of questions. What's the maximum height? What's the speed at each height? And how tall is the cliff if it hits the ground 10 seconds after it was thrown upward? So if you're going to solve this problem, what's the first thing you're going to do? Say again, Jess. Okay. Find the variables, the numbers that are given, and what you're looking for. So in this case, you were given a bunch of heights, y0, y1, y2, y3, and a y final. You don't know. So that's an unknown. You're also given, what else are you given? Okay, you're not given the acceleration, but you know it. You know the acceleration is 1g downward, 9.8 meters per second squared downward. You're given the initial velocity is 13 meters per second upward. And one last thing, you're given the total time. So now we're going to have to go through and pick out equations. Just given the information, if I want to find the speed at a given height, which equation is going to relate the speed and the height without knowing the time? The which one? Okay, she said the last one, and she's right. That will give me the speed. at each y. <laughs> All right, what about, so that was this one. What about finding the maximum height? Which equation is going to work for me to find the maximum height? What do you answer, Jonathan? The third one requires time, and I don't have the time for it. The same one. That's right. The same one. How can I use the same one to find that final height? What do I know about the peak position? The velocity is zero. So when I'm looking for the peak position, I don't know the height of it, but I know the velocity is zero. So that equation is going to work for all of them. So let's go to my solutions page. So I've written out all the variables there, and I've drawn myself a little picture showing the ball starts here, goes up, comes down, and hits the ground. Very simple. I did not draw one important thing. Now, notice I put an arrow with it to show the direction. Up at the top, instead of having an arrow or a vector thing, I have a subscript y. That subscript means in the y direction. What's the y direction? I need to indicate that on my figure that up is the positive y direction. You might ask, why am I using y? I'm using y because that's what they use for the vertical direction. So now with my kinematic equations, do you have a question, Colton? 
sort of trying to think how to ask it though. Um, <laughs> it, in a situation similar to this, let's say like down there where the, the drop ends yes. is a, a target, like would what you declare as a positive and negative direction depend on target or initial direction? Usually we use the convention of up is positive. And in this case, they gave us Y zero is this position. If they didn't give me a specification for the reference for where Y is zero, it would be equally useful to me to use the bottom as Y zero or the starting point as Y zero. So I would just make a choice. And you know, when you're working out a problem, you need to specify measured from here. So it's a choice. In, except for here where it was specified. Okay, now I have y is my variable. All of our kinematic equations had x in them. So what do I do if all my kinematic equations had x and I have y as my variable? I just change all the x's to y's because it's still the same equation. It's just I change the name of the variable. So I'm going to use... There, I put subscripts of y for everything. The final height minus the initial height is equal to the final vertical speed squared minus the initial vertical speed squared all over 2 times the vertical acceleration. Now I'm going to apply this for each case. But one thing I want you to note, this equation, it doesn't actually specify or matter if it's going up or down. Right, if y final is taken when it's going up or y final taken where it's going down, as long as it's you know 8.10 meters, it doesn't matter which direction it's going, you're gonna get the same answer. So motion of a projectile, when I throw the ball up, the motion is symmetric about the center point, about the top. So the height specifies the speed, whether it's going up or down. It could be an upward velocity or downward velocity, depending on if it's going up or down, but it'll be the same speed at a given height, as long as we can ignore air resistance. So let's go ahead and do this quickly. Now I'm looking for, for the first set, the speeds at each position. So I'm gonna solve this equation for V final. Solve for V final means I'd better multiply everything by 2AY. And that will give me V final squared minus V initial squared equals 2AY, Y final minus Y initial. Now my Y initial is zero, so I'm going to take that out of my equation. Can you do the same thing to uh, your velocity, y initial? No, because this time it did not start from rest. Mm -hmm. Jordan. Uh, so oh, by the way, the people southwestern probably didn't hear your question. The question was, can I put, can I remove the vy0 like I did the y0? And the answer was no, because in this case, vy0 was not equal to 0. Okay, Jordan. Um, the, uh, why, why did you add y to like 2a? Why did I add y? Because I wrote, I wrote I don't know, the, the, it's it's a minus sign here. No, in the um, he's asking about the subscript. In the oh yeah, um, because I could have had acceleration in the x direction, so I'm specifying in the vertical direction. The question was why is it a sub y and not just a? Okay. Because everything's in the y direction, so I just put subscripts of y for everything, except for y itself. You don't need to have y sub y. Okay, so there's my equation. I'm going to use that equation every time. And so Vy1 is equal to the square root of 13 meters per second quantity squared plus 2 times Ay. What is the value for Ay? It's at the top of the screen that you can't see anymore. Negative. It's very important to remember that negative. 9.80 meters per second squared. And then the Y1 was 8.10 meters. So I'm 
So there's my equation to find the speed at a height of 8.1 meters per second, a height of 8.1 meters. Wow, very impressive use of language. So someone with the calculator want to calculate this number for me? Question, Paris. Where, what is the 8.1 meters? Um, the 8.1 meters was the Y1, the, the height for the first place we're looking for. Oh. 3.2? Is there another digit on it? No. So zero is the next digit. So 3.20 meters per second. Now, there is one thing I did not write here that mathematically, to be a mathematical purist, I should have done. Whenever I do a square root, there are two answers, a positive and a negative. So realistically, this should have been plus or minus, plus or minus, plus or minus. I have two answers, plus 3.20 meters per second and minus 3.20 meters per second. Of course, when it's going up, only one of those can be correct. Which one's correct when it's going up? Positive. So what's the meaning of the other one? That's the answer when it's coming down. They're both correct answers, but one was for going up, one's for coming down. With other problems, like you know, if we have a problem where uh, a batter hits a baseball and it's got to go over the fence and then it hits the ground, and we ask, how long does it take for the ball to hit the ground? You're going to have a quadratic, and when you do that quadratic, you're going to get two answers, one that's a positive time and one that's a negative time. Which one is going to be the time from when it hits his bat until it hits the ground? The positive. Is there any meaning to the negative one? There kind of is. The negative one would have been the time the ball would have been projected from the ground to have reached his bat and then continued on with the trajectory. Of course, that's not physical because the ball didn't really do that. But there is kind of a meaning to it. It's not, you know, mathematical nonsense that you throw away because it's nonsense. It's just not the one you're looking for. Okay. Oh, my goodness. I have two minutes. I guess I won't do everything. Yes. For example, this show that, that um, yeah. Yeah, I, I expect you to show we have these two. This is the correct one. And this is why. Okay, because of time, I'm not going to find all of the um, speeds at each height, but I am going to jump straight to what was the height of the cliff if it takes 10 seconds to hit the ground. So we already identified the equation I'm going to use for that is still going to be y final minus y initial is equal to v. Um, wait a minute. <laughs> That's not the one. Um, <coughs> because we don't know the VY final or the we know the time. That, that was a mistake on my part. This was the equation I was going to use to find the time which it hits peak. But I am going to go straight to when it hits the ground. So when it hits the ground, we have the time. If we have the time and we have the acceleration, the initial position, the initial speed, which equation do I use then? It's the one with all the variables. So I'm just going to use y final is equal to y initial plus vy initial t plus one half a y t squared. Those should be finals, I suppose. And so that's going to be zero plus 13 meters per second multiplied by 10 seconds plus one half minus 9.80 meters per second squared times 10.0 seconds squared. So doing the math, that's equal to 130 meters minus 490 meters. One half of 9.8 is 4.9. Multiply that by 100, you get 490. So the cliff was 360 meters tall. 
And I guess I didn't use that page, and we won't do the problem with DJ Stevens with the highest measured vertical leap in the NBA, 46 inches. All right. Remember, I will put a link for Google Hangouts if you want to come and try to ask me questions from 3 to 5 this afternoon. Otherwise, have a good day. I'll see those of you at Union and Lab tomorrow.